Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twit Photo with Sarah Lane filling in for Catherine Hall and Leo Laporte. Episode 55, recorded Tuesday, May 1st, 2012. Frederick Van Johnson and Derek Story. Hello and welcome to another episode of Twit Photo. It's episode 55. As you have already guessed, Leo and Catherine are still in Norway. I was lucky enough to host the show solo last week, and the good people of Twit decided I didn't screw up too badly, and they've let me sit in one more time. <laughs> Leo and Catherine will be back next week, but we have an excellent show for you. We actually have a repeat guest joining us, Derek Story. Welcome back to Twit Thank Twitter you so much. Great to be here. And a new guest, which is kind of surprising to me since mm-hmm. you host a podcast called This Week in Photo. It's very similarly named. Frederick Van Johnson, <laughs> yes. welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. Before the show, I was saying, no, is it? This week in photography, this mm-hmm. week in photo, is there a difference? And you actually had kind of an interesting reason yeah, why you I mean, decided to Yeah, I mean, we started it. it as This Week in Photography. Mm-hmm. Um, and we did, I think it was about a year ago, maybe a little bit more, we did a little rebranding because we wanted to consolidate the name and Facebook and Twitter, you know, all the different social media presences. And we relaunched the blog. Mm-hmm. So the domain that was available was This Week in Photo, and that name was available on the social networks, too. So it just made sense to move everything over. So we're still battling. We, you can still call us This Week in Photography. We're okay with it. We'll right. answer. But, <laughs> but it's This Week in Photo is the brand. Yeah. It pretty much means the same thing. Yeah. Now, Derek, when, when was the last time that you were on Twit Photo? You said it was uh, it was just you and Leo and yes. you guys shot the breeze for an hour or so? Yeah, yeah. It was a couple months ago. Uh, Catherine uh, was out of town and we took over. Uh-huh. And, uh, nice. And they, uh, they said, great show, great show. When's Catherine coming back? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I get a little of that too. Good work, Sarah, temporarily. <laughs> Right. <laughs> All the other two are gone temporarily. It's well, it funny because Catherine was tweeting, "Yeah, great show, Derry. Great. Oh, by the way, everyone, I'm back next week. Just so. Yeah. It was fun. We had a good time. Now, what did we? What did? What did you and Leo focus on uh, when you were the guest the previous time? It was all about me. Yeah. Yeah. Your story. My your story. History. Yes, yes. We we took it way back to my youth. Yes. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So I'm like, get ready, joking? Frederick. <laughs> Hey, bring it on. <laughs> bring it on. When I was only five and a half feet tall, and then we just took it from there, yes. Wow. Oh, if, uh, only, so. if only I could ever be five and a half feet tall. Yeah. That was that when Derek really was nice. like two months old. Yeah, it was, it was pretty, pretty early in the <laughs> oh, wait, also, I also noticed you've got, a little, you've got a little operation going on in the background. Um, explain to our audience what you are doing behind the scenes here today. Well, I'm, I'm doing some testing today because I'm going to come back next week and we're going to do a time lapse in here nice. of all the activity going on. But it's not going to be a fixed time lapse. It's going to be a motion time lapse. So what does that mean? Because I think people, they go, oh, yeah, it's um, like the sunrise. It goes by really fast type thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's going to be on a tracker. So it's actually a star tracker. Uh-huh. But you can use that motor mount so that while you're recording the time lapse, the camera's slowly moving so that you get a panning motion. Mm. Same time you get all the activity going on. Wow. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Looking forward to and, that. And, you know, this studio is fantastic for photography. It's got depth and lights mm-hmm. and color. And this, it, it looked, the test looked really good. Cool. Yeah, it was, this is this kind of place is sort of made to be photographed even beyond. This the, is a playground. The sets it's, it's that you playground. see. This yeah. is a geek playground. Yeah. I love it. I'm not leaving. So Are you? So this is your first time here? <laughs> no, I've been here. Leo's giving me tours of the place, yeah. but this is my first time on the live set and right. kind of seeing how you guys do stuff. So cool. I'm excited. So, Frederick, since you're technically our, our virgin guest... I am. I am. In photography sense... Um, I, 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 go on. What, <laughs> besides This Week in Photo, what do you... I mean, what's your, what's your specialty? Obviously, you're, you're into photography. You mm-hmm. call yourself a photographer. Yep. How long have you been doing this? And, and, wow. and what's, your, what's your strength? So, I, I have two strengths. I have two sides of my brains. Um, I've been doing photography, you could say professionally, I guess, since 1989. So wow. went into the military in 1989 as a photographer mm-hmm. and then slowly became a combat photojournalist over eight years. Wow. So I was in there for eight years doing that. And then, long story short, left the military, came to Silicon Valley. They made me into this marketing guy, <laughs> you know, working for companies like... Uh, I started with Yahoo and then I went to I worked at Apple on the photography team for iPhoto and Aperture. And then also at Adobe. 
on Lightroom. That's where I met Mr. Story there. Actually, we met at Apple. Did we meet at Apple? We met at Apple. Oh, wow. That's, yeah. So okay. We, so See, we met at Apple. Adobe. That's a cool lapse of memory. Was <laughs> yeah. it Adobe or it was Apple? Apple? It was or one of those A companies. I don't know. So long ago. <laughs> the ones with the small market caps. I don't know. So, um, yeah, so now I am I started a company called Media Bytes that sort of merges both of those loves together. Mm-hmm. You know, on the it's, it's a consultancy for photographers on how to get the word out about their product or services, marketing-wise, using social media, all that stuff. So, And then an, in tandem with all this stuff is the podcast. So This Week in Photo, which I've been hosting with Alex Lindsay when mm-hmm. he's not in some weird place around the world. Right. So uh, we do that, and that, that exercise is the part of my brain that just loves to like play with new technologies and social media and to see how all this stuff works, because it's just crazy. you know. So that's kind of what I do. So Derek, you also are in the podcasting world, um, and obviously we're on yet another photography-focused podcast. Yep. I've always thought it's, it's interesting to watch when Twit decided that uh, we wanted to have a photography show because Mm -hmm. there's so much, not only technology, but social aspects and kind of geek elements of the genre. Um, It seemed like a perfect fit, but it could go in many directions. And what Mm -hmm. this show has kind of become is a little bit more of a, um, you know, focus on so-and-so, a little Mm -hmm. bit of history, a little bit of um, what what makes a photographer tick, some tips and tricks type of a thing. Mm How do you approach This Week in Photo? So This Week in Photo is <clears throat> in some ways similar to that, but it is more of a roundtable of photographers. So we have myself acting as host, or I like to say ringmaster, mm-hmm. and we have folks like Derek on and other people that are much smarter than me come on the show to talk about different aspects of whatever the week's news is. So that's where the This Weekend comes in. Yeah. So whatever the week's news, whatever happens, so... You know, Facebook acquires, you know, uh, Instagram. So we talk about that and what the impacts of it are. So that's a news piece of it. But we also tend to go into gear and, okay, this new piece of gear came out and why is it important? But we don't go in, we go into some of the technicals about the gear, but we tend to go into more of, do you really need this? You know, is it important? Like Derek and I did a show once. It was a one on one show where we're talking about the 5D Mark III and do photographers really need this thing? You know, and, Personally, my standpoint on a lot of this stuff is it's more of a less gear kind of standpoint. It is, you know, become a better artisan with the gear you have and then add to it incrementally. I think Derek is kind of in that camp a little bit, too. But that's kind of that's kind of the way the show goes. And then we intersperse interviews in there. So we we're not a live show. Well, we're kind of live on Google Plus now, but we record interviews with different photographers offline and Mm -hmm. then insert them into the show later. So it ends up being. You know, discussion, discussion, news, interview, insert, listener questions, then it's over. Well, so. and you mentioned, um, you know, something like Instagram. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, that's just that just turns the conversation inherently social because right. not only is everybody talking about it, yeah. but this is a uh, these are photographer photography based services that are also social networks. Totally, totally, yeah. And it, one of, a lot of the questions that, that I get personally are, how do I use this stuff? You know, mm-hmm. I mean, do I need it? Like with Pinterest, they just showed up. Do, relatively speaking, they just showed up. Sure. You know, do we, you know, do photographers need to care about it? If so, how do they care about it? How do you manage all this stuff and still be a photographer? You know, <laughs> so it's all this stuff together that photographers have to struggle with to stay current on the one hand and just you know to stay current on what's happening in the photography universe but also what's happening in the social universe and how they how do they merge together and then layering on top of that is the gear stuff you're like okay all this crazy gear is coming out too do i need to buy everything that came out and sign up for pinterest and then tweet every five minutes and then oh facebook changed their terms of service again i need to know about that you know so it's a new era for, for image makers, and there's a lot of new responsibilities, and, you know, we talk about them. So, for example, a company uh, like Pinterest, who has put sort of a modern spin on not necessarily the most novel idea, mm-hmm. that's kind of the way that I see it, yeah. um, but, but is delighting the hearts and minds of many people online. When someone says, okay, I'm interested in photography, I love your show, what's your advice to me? What do you say to people like that who have heard of a new social network that they could incorporate a hobby, a love of photography, mm-hmm. or even, uh, you know, a career into? I think it, it goes back to, you got to work backwards. you got to begin with the end in mind. So what are your goals? Mm-hmm. Like if you are a, you're a wedding photographer, right? So your goal is probably to meet, to, to reach brides and show them your work so they potentially hire you. Yeah. You don't necessarily want to be tweeting about, hey, my cat just threw up a hairball or, you know, 
they don't really care about that. They care about this other stuff. But on the other hand, if your goal, your wedding photographer and your end goal is to uh, increase your network of people that can refer weddings to you, referrals, so again, other photographers, then the vernacular that you use to speak to them needs to be targeted at other photographers and not brides. So, and it goes for all these other services, YouTube, everything. Everything you do, you need it needs to generally be focused, not explicitly, but generally be focused on the thing that your end goal is. You know, right. a lot of people get into this stuff and they're like, well, hey, I saw Derek's story. He has a blog, so I'm going to get a blog. Hey, Frederick has a YouTube channel, so I'm going to get a YouTube. And they don't know what they're doing. They're just shooting in the dark. But if you turn on the light and say, okay, my goal is to, hey, I want to shoot landscapes and I want to be known for landscapes and... I want to reach people that care about, or I want to. I want to liaise with other photographers who shoot landscapes. That's who you're talking to. That's who your audience is. And some people go even so far as to, you know, put a photo up on the wall. Like when you're blogging, you put a photo up on the wall of who your target audience is. And then when you're writing, you just kind of glance at that, you know. So maybe you're writing to like a newbie that doesn't know anything about photography, and that's your audience. So you look at some guy that's trying to figure out his camera, and then you're writing the next sentence, and it helps you in your brain form what you should be writing and you know if it's somebody that's new you want to keep it a little bit more pedestrian rather than being all technical so it's that kind of stuff Derek what do you think do you do you agree with Frederick's approach that you might not want to share aspects of yourself that aren't going to help further your goal or even get you work well I, I Frederick and I have talked about this a lot and I think his his point is really good and I think it would help the general bulk of photographers out there. It's not exactly the way that I do it. Mm -hmm. uh, I figured out a long time ago, because this is all I do, I, I'm a working photographer, and uh, I figured out a long time ago the only way I was going to survive this is just to be myself. Mm -hmm. So what I do on Digital Story or when I'm on Twitter or anywhere else is that I'm just basically talking about what I did yesterday, what I did the day before, what interests me, and all that. And that allows me, so for instance, if I'm working on an article for Macworld Magazine, I'm probably going to talk about that on the podcast. Mm -hmm. If I just did a shoot for uh, story photography, I'll write about that on the blog and talk about it. And so it, it just becomes kind of my life, and hopefully my life is, ends up being somewhat interesting to people who are in photography. And if nothing mm -hmm. else, authentic. Well, so, so much easier because what happens is, you know, Frederick raised some really good points, especially about social networks. You really have to figure out how much time you have to dedicate to that and how you're going to do it. And even once you set aside that chunk of time, if you're always in your head figuring, well, what do, what do people want to hear or what should I be talking about, you're going to be inconsistent unless you really get to the bottom of, you know, what your message is. Whereas, in my case, if I'm just talking about what I'm doing and what I think, then I never really have to worry about any of that sort of stuff. It's just every day is pretty much what you got the day before, except I'm grappling with something new. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just, it, for me, it's worked really well. So it's not, it's not for everyone. I think between the two of us, I think there are, there are probably uh, some pretty good ideas, though, if you're thinking of getting into this. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting, too, you, you bring up about being yourself, because <clears throat> the, the problem with being yourself is wherever you go, you're always there. <laughs> so, right. And if you come up with a persona, a lot of people say, oh, build this persona of who you want to be. You can be anybody online, right? You build this persona, once, once you've built that, then you are committed to being that whenever you're in public. Right. Yes, you are. So now you're at a conference and you're supposed to be this whatever person you've built. Now you got to be that person, you know, whereas if you follow Derek's advice and just be yourself, you're just yourself. You know, like I'm like this all the time. You mm -hmm. know, Derek and I talk just like this over coffee. So it's I'm not trying to be something that I'm not. It's just and it, it becomes effortless and more realistic and genuine. Sure. And you don't have to act. And, right. And yeah. you don't have to remember what you said you were going to do. Exactly. I mean, I, I would say for the most part. That's exactly how all of us act at Twit as well, mm -hmm. because it's it, it's just too hard to do every day otherwise. Yeah. Oh, totally. It is hard. Like, it I is. can't become somebody else. Well, yeah. think about it. I mean, if you've ever been in a relationship where you couldn't really be yourself, but mm -hmm. you like the other person, it's exhausting. Mm -hmm. it's, I mean, you know, you're going, wow, we've been on this date for four hours. And 
I, I really need to go home. Whereas if you're in a relationship where you're with someone where you just get to be yourself, you can go on forever. Mm -hmm. You can just, you know, hang out. And, and I, think, I think being on social networking, to me, is, is a relationship, right? It's a relationship with a, a bunch of people that you're, you know, conversing with. And is, to me, it's just the same as dating in the sense that if I, myself, I can do a lot more and last a lot longer. Yeah, then, you know, then uh, if I have to be someone else. Can you imagine if Lady Gaga had to be Lady Gaga all the time? <laughs> <laughs> Do we know that she's not? Yeah, well, you know, I'm not convinced. That might not be the I'm best. Betting she's not she's actually like. Yeah, yeah, that's. I'm betting no. I'm betting, <laughs> I'm betting no. Too. She's not wearing those, you know, twelve inch heels to right. bed. You know? Talk about exhausting. <laughs> Talk about dangerous. Yeah. But <laughs> why is it so? You know, sometimes I'll I'll have a photographer that I become familiar with. And I love their work. And I know very few professional photographers, you know, besides mm -hmm. some of the people that I'm lucky enough to meet through Twit. Mm -hmm. And I often just have no idea what kind of person that they are. I yeah. think that there's that, um, it's, it's sort of that legendary, they don't say much, you know, they give you a little direction, but it's all about how they're trying to capture your personality right. rather than their own mm -hmm. how do you how do you approach that relationship when you're shooting when people? i'm shooting yeah i mean it's it's really interesting i i love shooting people i mean you were asking about what kind of photographer i am mm -hmm. i'm a, i would call myself a people photographer so mm -hmm. I, I like shooting people because they change more than landscapes generally speaking yeah and they're more appreciative um <laughs> so um but part of being a photographer especially when you're a people photographer is psychology and being being that person that knows how to draw the personality that you think is in that person out to capture that image and then being proficient on the technical side in order to get get the image so um you know when for me it's again it's back to being yourself it's starting up a rapport with this person bring setting them at ease letting them know that when you when you're shooting them you're you know what you're doing and you're going to take care of them and you're not you're not going to make them look like an idiot in the photo because I'm quote unquote a professional photographer right so it's the rapport building, and it goes all the way through. If I'm shooting a model, it's it's from beginning to end. It's you know you set boundaries, and then you build rapport, and you execute the shoot within this sort of sphere of hey, we're in this together. We're collaborating. You are on the you know you're reflecting the light, and I'm capturing the light. Mm -hmm. But to, this is a symbiotic kind of relationship that we, in the end, if we do everything right, we will have a shot. I have to ask you, how did you go from combat photography? Uh, while during your time in the military mm -hmm. to being in marketing in Silicon Valley? That's an interesting story. I asked myself <laughs> that same question. How does that happen? It's awesome. <laughs> okay, so rewind. Let's go back in the Wayback Machine. Um, so when I left the military, I took a job initially in Silicon Valley at the San Jose Mercury News. Mm -hmm. And this was back when, remember when? Remember the days when you, if you told people you were a web designer or a, or a webmaster, that meant something, you know, something bigger than it does today. It meant, most people were like, that sounds like something I don't know how to do. <laughs> exactly. And it might be a lot of money in that. You're right. So um, I joined the Mercury News as, a, as their chief multimedia producer, and I was helping them do things like put this this new technology that was might have had legs back then called Flash on the website. They're experimenting with it. So we're doing that kind of stuff and then doing quick time, you know, the Mercury News was trying to be leading. They had started this new part of the Mercury News called the Mercury Center. Mm -hmm. And I was part of that group. So um, but for me, you know, just sort of fast forward through it. For me, it was kind of like we're we're at this news organization that's in the center of Silicon Valley, and I'm like, look at Yahoo, you know, look at all these different companies, this AltaVista, all these different companies are doing all this cool stuff, and I felt like I was like, I was like a, a factory worker working at the paintbrush factory, but secretly wanting to paint, you know, so uh -huh. I'm like, I want to be out there with those companies. Uh, but, and then lo and behold, I got recruited by Yahoo. They were still growing, I mean, I think they were at like, maybe in the 500 employee sort of yeah, that's you know, back in the day. Very different story than they may be heading back towards. I don't yeah, know. well, slowly but surely. <laughs> slowly but surely, it's my age. <laughs> uh, but this was back when they were Yahoo was back. They were like a short time after I was there. They were thinking about acquiring Disney, and you know, it was back when Yahoo had wow. weight. You know, um, and they owned the world. So they brought me on in. Uh, product marketing, product management to handle a service that they had called Yahoo Computers. It was funny. They had the the Yahoo MO back then was okay. Let's put a body on this. There's somebody successful in this. It was CNET at the time. So like CNET is killing it on the computer side. We need to monetize that. Okay, you're gonna build Yahoo Computers. Here's a biz dev guy and here's an engineer. Make it happen. 
Yeah. So it was me and th- me and two other guys going against CNET, which was still, you know, even now they're successful. But back then they were. Well, so what are you shooting? Computers on black drapes? Type no, thing? no, no, no. This was I wasn't shooting. That was a thing. Oh, I okay. Went, I went out of creative. So I they see. plucked me out of my creative comfort zone and dropped me into, you know, hey, you're a business guy now. You're going to be in meetings all day, answering phones and answering emails. You know, so my photography got pushed to, or my creative outlet got pushed to, you know, weekends and after work. Well, I, uh, were, were you burned out on photography at that point? It's not as if you were forced out of shooting yeah. on a daily no, basis. No, not so much, but it was, I mean, part of it was a monetary decision. It's mm-hmm. like, okay, stock yeah. options Things at are Yahoo. Things looking pretty good. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I want these stock options. You know, hey, I'll, I'll try it out. I can always shoot, you know. So it was, and it was exciting. It was, you know, let's try something new. Let's experiment and see what this this whole high-tech company thing is about, you know. So, you know, it was, I'm an experimenter. So that's what I did. So, Derek, the two of you met at Apple. Mm-hmm. Uh, I could have swore it was Adobe. Do you remember what year it was? <laughs> iPhoto. It was iPhoto. It was, you, were, you were both working on iPhoto? I was working on iPhoto. I was a product manager for iPhoto. And, Derek, what were you doing? You were writing a book on it? Or? Yeah, David David Pogue and I did iPhoto, the missing manual. Right. So yeah. we were working on it. And in those days, in, uh, things changed a lot at Apple, obviously. But in those days, we would actually uh, hang out with the uh, product managers and, and while we were working on projects and sort of make sure that when the product came out, the, the book reflected you know, the, what was going on there. So uh, I, uh, I did both uh, iPhoto and then I did uh, an Aperture site, a community Aperture site for Riley Media. Yeah. And uh, so I was at Apple a lot in those days. Yep. And that's where we met. And you were actually, we were working on, uh, I remember we were talking about uh, uh, making prints out of iPhoto, the mm-hmm. print service, and all that yeah, stuff. That yeah. was something that you were working yep, on. Yeah, I was. I was heading that up, and that yeah. that business was. I mean, it was the, so the Apple Print Services was a business, and it continues to be a business within Apple that handles mm-hmm. printing out of iPhoto and sure. Aperture and even iCards. You know that kind of stuff. Somebody just gave me a photo book recently. It's one of the nicest things I ever got. I had a hand in that way back in the day. <laughs> all right, so. thank you. That was a good anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> so that was that was fun. That was fun. But that was that was one of those thankless kind of marketing jobs because right. it's a it's a it's a it's like a gear that's inside of the Apple machine. It's not like you're going to go market all this stuff. You know, it was just sort of there and it worked and people were delighted when they got the product. But it wasn't like we were. It wasn't front and center. Look no, what we're doing because no. it seems a little I mean, analog. Or... Yeah, it was a footnote in a keynote. So. <laughs> so Derek, you mentioned before the show that that Frederick is one of the reasons that you got into podcasting yourself. No, 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 no. I think the I, I've been in podcasting for for quite a while. Maybe mm-hmm. I got it backwards. Yes. Yeah, he beat you us. Did. You're on episode three hundred or something. Right? Yes. That Frederick is even no. here right no. now. <laughs> Derek is secretly my father. <laughs> I was going to ask, but it makes a lot of sense. He's We're says. just going to come clean now, Derek. Ready to book, <laughs> how convenient! You're both at Apple, obviously related. Yeah. Yeah, uh, actually, I've been podcasting since when, when uh, Apple allowed uh, podcasts into the iTunes. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, I, you know, I go, th- this is the time to, to make the move because, you know, they'll help me market my, my podcast for me. And before that, uh, po- marketing podcasts was, was harder. It was more difficult. So I, I jumped in then, and doing the Digital Story podcast has led to, uh, you know, all, all these other shows that I'm on it has has had a big part of it. So, so being in podcasting from sort of the start of when podcasts were available on iTunes, phase two, I call it. Yeah, about 2005. Wow. Mm-hmm. So, what do you? I mean, <laughs> the state of things today is, and obviously we have a lot of competitors too, just mm-hmm. in the, sp- in the mm-hmm. space. But everybody, it's like you can't find a subject that doesn't have. A hundred people trying to make the same podcast. Yeah. How do you feel? You know, how do you, how do you approach things now that that it's such a saturated market? Well, I haven't changed anything. It 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 makes it easier when you got a head start. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Because you I, can always say, "Well, I was first. Well, and not only that, you just build audience over time, and and uh, all of that sort. Of, you have a certain amount of momentum. So I, I think starting early has allowed me to just do it the way I want it and, and not worry about the numbers. The numbers have taken care of themselves. Uh, I have noticed, though, lately in the last year, 
that there's been a bit of a, a spike. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it's kind of been a gradual thing, and then there's been a spike. So I'm not sure what's going on with that. I think it's podcasting in general is mm -hmm. getting on, on more radar mm -hmm. right now. But, uh, but certainly uh, in 2005, it, it was exciting. And, you know, when you got the, like, the first 1,000 subscribers, you, you know, you felt, you know, it's a good feeling. Yeah. Kind of like you're on top of the world. Right. Yeah. I still feel like I struggle sometimes to say, subscribing doesn't mean you have to pay me anything. <laughs> yeah. It just it's means it's easy to stay on top of each episode. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What, I mean, how, do you, how does uh, This Week in, in Photo approach the, the, the wealth of information out there that people could, could find beyond your podcast for photography? It's interesting. I have my own little patented way of, of, of approaching it, and I call it the ostrich kind of way of working i stick my head in the sand and focus only on the podcast it's like someone once told me um you don't you don't win a race not that we're all competing you know because there's so many different facets of photography that yeah. there's probably room for even more right um but it's you know it, it someone told me once if you're if you're you don't win a race by looking to the left and to the right at the people that are running with you you look towards the goal you look forward and see what else you can do so now, that's what I do. We, we kind of have a, a formula that seems to work and seems to resonate with our audience. So we alter it every now and then. Like, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we added Google Plus Hangouts to it, you know, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But, um, you know, it's not like, I mean, not that I would have time to listen to all the podcasts that are out there. But I'm just doing our, we're just doing our own thing. You know, yeah. we, we have, a, we try to get smart people like Derek on to help us explain things and we just do it, you know. And the show itself, it's not a... Uh, for me, it's, it doesn't even feel like it's my show anymore. You know, I'm, I'm the host of it, but it feels like it's a community thing that they, the community allows me to host. You know, it's got its own life. I right think now. that's a, yeah. a really good point. And, and we discover that in, in the web world, too, in that you can't operate under the illusion that, it, that, you're, that it's yours. Right. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the minute you do that and you start, you know, say you start going willy-nilly all over the place, uh, your audience will let you know that they're not happy about that. And then you discover real fast that actually your audience, uh, you know, they're, they're probably the, the board of directors and, oh, yeah. and maybe we're the CEO, kind, <laughs> oh, of, yeah. kind of the situation yeah. like that. So uh, you, you really do uh, have to be in touch with them. I mean, that, that's one of the most important things. The other thing I think is super important is consistency. Just mm -hmm. be consistent. Release the show at the same time, you know, every week or every day, depending on what kind of show you have. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you uh, establish a format, uh, stick to the format. It doesn't mean you can't change it, but, but I think people come to expect you. I do a weekly show, and I know a whole bunch of my listeners. Uh, it comes out on Tuesday, and I know a whole bunch of them. That's what they listen to on the way to work on Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah. So I, that's my slot. I get, I get them on Wednesday morning when they're riding the train or however they go to work. Yep. So I can't come out with the podcast on Wednesday night. Or, right. or, I mess or you up. have to have a good reason. Here's yeah. what happened. Yeah. Everybody heads up so that you don't get a bunch of angry people saying. Well, the thing that I've discovered is I just find a way to get it out. So if I'm sitting with a headset in a hotel room, in Las Vegas, plugged into my laptop, and that's where I happen to be, that's where I have to record the podcast. Yep. And it's not going to be quality-wise maybe as good as what I normally do in my studio in Santa Rosa, but the podcast is out, and it's, it's very current, and it's what's going on, and I made my deadline. And mm -hmm. I just think that that is very important when you have, essentially we have people depending on us, you know, and so we have to live up to that. Yeah. Totally understand that. So we've talked a little bit about uh, community, um, the, how to approach uh, the, the aspect of social networking to, to get your name and your brand out there and to make sure that, that, that people keep coming back. What are your social networks of choice? Oh, wow. Well, mine, in no particular order, mm -hmm. Twitter. Still a fan of Twitter. Yeah. Um, just because I like the brevity and the, the sort of yeah. Scandinavian, just you only get what you need. <laughs> Kind of the IKEA board. social networks. The IKEA, right? the IKEA social networks. Yeah. I'm not sure I understand. The <laughs> less so, is more. Analogy. Okay. It's less is Got more. It. Okay. 140 characters. Sure. Except, except without it's the funny Scandinavian. words. It's Scandinavian. That should be it's their simple. new tagline. Yeah. Twitter. Yeah. It's like IKEA. Maplewood and breast aluminum. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, I guess it would be Twitter first. Facebook. I have a love hate relationship with Facebook. Uh, there's just there's just so much going on on Facebook. I feel like it's evolving into an operating system, you yeah. know, and I don't have time to learn another operating system. So my knee jerk reaction is just, OK, 
one day when I have a week to spare, I'm going to sit down and figure all that stuff out. So it's Facebook. And then uh, the third one now is Google Plus, you know, and that, that is climbing in popularity for me. I just, you know, I'm just a fan of the layout of Google Plus and the Hangout feature. Mm-hmm. And just, you know, for me, it feels like it's uh, it's what, you know, if, if Facebook and Twitter had sort of said, OK, let's collaborate on a social network. Google Plus would have been what they came up with. So, you know, it's like some of the best pieces of both that are in one one little uh, or one large and growing social network. What is it about Google Plus that photographers like so much? Well, they display our pictures nicely. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. you know, we That's a plus. we like that and and you know, after all those years of suffering putting a picture on Facebook and then like, <laughs> "Oh my gosh." Yeah. <laughs> right. Really, I, I take better pictures than that. I mean, that's that's what mm-hmm. you wanted to say as soon yeah. as it went up. So, I, I think that's what attracted uh, photographers to it initially, just visually it was very nice. Yeah. Yeah, it is it is really nice. I mean, just the the presentation um but one thing that we talk about on, on this week in photo a lot is the just the the copyright issues and ownership mm-hmm. issues when you put images on one of these social networks you know in a lot of depending on the on the terms of service you may be giving rights away that you mm-hmm. didn't know you were giving away so you know i would encourage people that are that are considering even google plus or facebook or whatever just to be cognizant and be aware of what the the terms of service are when you upload images on there i know photographers that refuse to upload anything to facebook because facebook you know essentially owns it when you put it up there um or you know same with Flickr. you know you put images on Flickr. And if you, for and you upgrade to a plus account, if you downgrade to a free account, then essentially your images are kind of held hostage. Yeah, until you I'm pay actually again. have that problem right now. Yeah, I mean, yeah. one of these days I'll get around to going back to the Flickr Pro account, mm-hmm. but for now, most of my collections I can't even click through. Yeah, see, so which which if you knew that in the beginning, you might have made different choices mm-hmm. about where to put your images. You know, I for me personally, like my my website. I, I'm a big fan of Smug Mug, so for paid work, I'll put stuff on Smug Mug in a gallery, you know, that sort of thing, and mm-hmm. give people access to it. But for my, on my website, my, my personal gallery, I use a service called Slideshow Pro. Okay. Slideshowpro.net is the URL to them. And essentially, it's a back-end service that allows you to go in and build galleries. And these can be smart galleries. These can be galleries that you say, show these five images only during Christmas and show the rest on, you know, Hanukkah, whatever. So you can do all this cool stuff and then embed the slideshow wherever you want it to go. But on the back end, I control everything. It's all my images. You know, it's not controlled by a third party. Right. So, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's sort of my hybrid of how I like to do. I still put stuff on on uh, Flickr, you know, but it's generally stuff that I shoot with my iPhone or mm-hmm. stuff that it's a different kind of audience feel. You know, if there's something that I want feedback on, I'll put it on Flickr to get people to comment on. But for large, you know, 900 pixel wide display, I'll put it on my website using Slideshow Pro, Slideshow Pro um, and kind of go from there. And if it's for sale or if it's a it's a client, you know, I'll put it on on SmugMug. It's amazing how Flickr has gone from and. I've never used it for professional photography because I'm not one, but there was a time where I felt like there were a lot of professional photographers just kind of in my vicinity, my online community, on Flickr, and Mm -hmm. that was just because that was the the photo place to put your stuff at the time. It doesn't seem like it's necessarily the best option for anybody anymore. Well, they were, I mean, we've seen the story so many times before. Mm -hmm. They were so far ahead. And uh, now suddenly they're very far behind. Uh, I personally, I love Flickr. You know, I, I still do, and, and I'm still optimistic that something good will happen there. I just read that uh, that uh, woo, you know, new Flickr uploaders coming, and so I, I read the blog post on uh, Flickr about it, but uh, it's not quite ready yet. And it's just like, so you know, what's what's going on there with them? They just seem to have a hard time pulling the trigger right now on on new things. Yeah. But personally, I, I like them a lot. Um, uh, it's a great place to share photos. I would have loved to have seen on. There's Flickr. a lot of good imagery on Flickr. Yeah, there's so I much really... cool stuff there, and it's such, I mean, it's like a five mile deep silo of photography oh, just... with this. I mean, this is my own personal opinion, but the UI on top of that file, oh, five mile deep is yeah. just yeah. not good. And if they had just taken that and got some really smart UI designers in there, like the folks that did 500px.com, mm-hmm. and made Flickr look like that and just say okay we're going to make something that photographers really love you know or even taking a clue from google plus and how they're displaying images yeah. then 
I would have been okay with paying more money and, you know, maybe even the hostage situation. <laughs> okay yeah. with it. Right. But, you know, it's like, oh, geez, innovate a little. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, they, they really need to move. They, yeah. need, they need to move. And it's still not too late, but they got to get going. Mm-hmm. Well, again, it's that whole Yahoo thing. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, they're, they've got, they've got a maybe bigger fish to fry. I, it depends on how you look at it. But yeah. they're certainly busy over there. Yep. So, Frederick, we, we have almost barely not talked about your your style beyond the fact that you said you like to shoot people Mm -hmm. um they're dynamic they give you feedback it's kind of fun what would you say we've looked at some of the photos uh without directly addressing them while we've been talking sure there's kind of an ethereal thing i see going on Mm -hmm. is that what's your what's your kind of what's your thing i don't know i mean i don't know that i have a thing i mean i like 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 if i'm in a in a in a a session i'm shooting a model for example you know, typically it will begin with me sitting down on some other day with her at, at a Starbucks or something and talking about, you know, collaborating about what the shoot could be, you yeah. know. Um, and also the the secret sort of agenda there is to make sure that she's not insane and I can, we can right. actually work together. Yeah, it you won't know? be a horrible day. Yeah, it could, it could turn out really <laughs> badly, you know. Uh, now, so, you say she, only females? No, no, there's, there's, there's guys in my portfolio yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, the majority are female. Mm-hmm. Um but, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know, like I was saying, I don't know that I have a thing. I, I like, like, if you look at my portfolio, I like really tight shots. I like close-ups. I mm-hmm. like eyes, you mm-hmm. know, the eyes have it, you know, for me. Yep. Like, when I go through things, it's like the, you look at the eyes first, and then you look at the rest of the image, you know. I try not to over-retouch my, model, my models unless they've specifically requested it. Right. You know, because I like that feel of... Uh, reality to them. You know, one of my friends is a photographer. He's one of the centerfold photographers for Playboy, and he was telling me that they. I mean, these guys when they when they do a, a Playboy centerfold shoot, they'll go in and meticulously light every little shadow with like I don't know, fifty lights. You know, like there, there's too much there's too much shadow on that hair follicle. Let's put a light on it. You know, mm-hmm. that's what they do to avoid doing too much retouching in in Photoshop. And See, I always assumed that they didn't even really care yeah. what it looked like coming out of the you know the photo shoot itself because you're just going to the blast skin anyway. that whole no, thing. No, no, that's what I thought. That's what I thought until I sat down with them. And there's actually a video interview on my YouTube channel and on the site. Okay. Um, with these guys, and we, I asked them specifically. You know, how I mean, are you retouching? them or are you just like hey come in with no makeup and we'll, we'll put digital makeup on you later no they uh they try not to in fact i don't know how much i believe this but they said we use no photoshop and i'm like you know i gotta call the yes on that one because i've seen these images <laughs> and nobody's that perfect you know so well they I, didn't say we don't use any photo retouching no but software. he did he said he said he doesn't use it now they may have a team of retouchers in the back room uh-huh. technically <laughs> i don't know technically open that i don't do any ever. photoshop yeah but you know the the point is you know for me when i'm shooting i like i like a, an air of reality mm-hmm. you know because i i feel it's in some ways it's almost insulting sometimes if you like you take a picture of a, a woman and she might have a mole or something right there and that mole may be sentimental she may sure. like that mole and you take mm-hmm. it off you know so, and I, I make it clear in the beginning that I'm not going to make you look like you have an inch of makeup on. You know, we're, right. we're, we're going for not the harsh reality, but we want to, we don't, the idea for retouching or when you're cleaning up an image, especially a person, is to be like a burglar, right? You don't want to leave any tracks. You know, you don't want people to look at it and say, oh, clearly retouched. Look at mm-hmm. that. No one looks like that. You want them to look at it and say, oh, wow. I can't tell if that's been retouched or not. Yeah. So you say that, but then there's you know uh, entire blogs devoted to magazine covers and things like that where people go terrible Photoshop or yeah. she doesn't look anything like that or yep. he, he's missing a leg. That's you know it's, <laughs> it's like why why does it end up being so shoddy so much of the time? <laughs> when, the, when photographers <laughs> who have talent all say don't do that. It's skill, all right? Well, there that's always almost always a compromise situation, right? Mm-hmm. And. Uh, you learn this as a writer too, because I do both. But there, when you write for a magazine or a paper or, or a, a big blog, there's a person who writes the article, and then there's a person who writes the headline, and they're mm-hmm. usually not the same people because the headline guy is really good at headlines. Mm-hmm. Writer guy is doing what he's supposed to be doing, and a lot of times, writer will be shocked by what they see on the headline. They go, "Whoa, whoa, whoa!" It's great headlines getting people over here. That's not really what the story's about. And I think we see the same thing in imaging where the photographer delivers the goods, 
but a lot of times at that point, uh, they don't have control unless it's their own thing. And uh, so then the image you know, is, is handled. I mean, first of all, the image is chosen by an editor, not by the photographer. And then what happens to it is you know, there's art directors and all sorts of folks involved. Right. So it's a lot of times when you get a lot of cooks in that kitchen, you can end up with some interesting casseroles. And I think that's <laughs> what you're referring to here. Yeah. There's actually, have, you, have you both seen the documentary, The September Issue? about shooting the, the big uh, uh, fashion uh, edition of Vogue every year. No, I haven't seen that. It's very good. Uh, even if you don't like fashion, because just sort of an insider look at how mm -hmm. a big conglomerate magazine gets put together. But there's a scene that's exactly that same thing, mm -hmm. where the art director says um, she, you know, she loves this picture, and they like it too, but they're going to put it through post, and she's telling yeah. them, do not touch this picture. I like it the way he is. Somebody kind of had like a pot belly, and they were going to make him look slimmer. And right. she's like, no, you're going to ruin it. Yeah. It's good the way that it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not sure if she got her wish or not, but yeah. it was interesting for me to say, gosh, she's not even in control at this point, yeah. even though she put together a beautiful spread. It reminds me, re reminds me of that whole controversy around Adele, right, the, the pop singer. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's the latest album cover um, that she has out and it has a headshot of her on there. Yeah. And it's heavily retouched. Right. So much because she's, she's a slightly overweight woman normally. Um, and they made her not so on yeah. the image code. And apparently she was not happy with that, you know. So it's those kind of things, you know. Like it, for me, I was looking at that whole situation. I was thinking, yeah, that's exactly right. If she said that she wants to look like she looks, why would someone in, the, in Photoshop say, hey, you, to me, you look better like this, you know, and change her? So. Yeah. Well, it depends on you know what the what the purpose is, and a lot of times, in publications, uh, the different uh, contributors are at cross purposes. The photographer, a lot of times, uh, I, I'm the same way. I like to represent the person the way I say it is how they look on a good day. That that's what I'm mm -hmm. after. Yeah, exactly. And uh, but if I'm handing that shot over to a big publication. Their purpose is to sell lots of right. editions of whatever it is that they're selling. So we don't exactly have the same the same goal right. sometimes, mm -hmm. and I think that's where interesting things and sometimes very sad things happen. Yeah. It almost sort of sounds like, and Frederick ha having had the uh, experience in Silicon Valley that you've had, both of you really, it's like the difference between the programmer who has sort of this beautiful vision mm -hmm. and then it turns into something about money and then mm -hmm. you have an issue yeah. with the relationship between... Yeah, it's always, that, it's always that, the, the tug of war between the engineering manager and the product marketing manager. <laughs> right. <laughs> who have, yeah. you know, product marketing manager is in touch, in Silicon Valley, is in touch with the the user, right? And then the engineer knows the code and what's possible and the timelines and all that and then you have to kind of agree on something in between. Same with photography. Well, what were your years in combat photography like? You must have gotten some amazing photographs. Yeah, it was fun. I mean, back when I was doing it, you know, like anybody in the military will tell you it sucks, you know. Hey, why did I even do this? But then in You were you were a photographer before you no. joined? No. No, I was no. not. I didn't know. I went in, I knew I wanted to do something creative, but uh -huh. they took my raw material and then pounded it into a photographer. <laughs> wow. So, no, it was great. So, my my years there, I spent my first two years in, uh, or at Yokota Air Force Base, in, or, or Air Base, actually, in Tokyo, mm -hmm. where I felt like a mole, because I was in the dark room. This was back in the film days. Sure. So I was in the dark room from, I don't know, 7.45 to 6 o'clock every day, processing film that came back from other photographers, you know, that were deployed in the field. So in there, I learned, I mean, this was like repetitious learning chemistry developing film de developing slide film medium format large format um printing you know all this stuff so we were we were the photo lab but every photographer in there or lab worker in there had to have the skills to do anything at any given time so right. if a roll of slide film came in there process it mount it get it back to the client mm -hmm. black and white film process it proof it get it back to the client you know there was no room for error so um and in during that time is we're, we're also learning photography as well so um learning the aspects of light when you're when you're learning photography in the military i'm not sure how it is today but back then they were we went into like the nuances of light like the speed of light and how does that affect the film and you know how is what's the chemical makeup of film and why do these things that are called silver halide on the substrate react in a certain way and the spacing between all this like you had to have all this in your mm -hmm. head it's like chemistry it's it was chemistry yeah and then 
for me, you know, it was an evolution because I went in like, oh, this is all so cool. This is like, you know, it's chemistry, right? Having f- chemistry and art mixed together. And then it slowly became art and technology mixed together and the chemistry went away, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, so my first two years were kind of that, you know, it was kind of learning the ins and outs of photography and getting a really good detailed education on every aspect of it. I mean, we did everything from investigative photography to sports photography we were called on to do i mean my first i think my first week there i did an autopsy i had to shoot an autopsy and i think they gave it to me on purpose because i was the new guy yeah right (laughs) so so i had to do that so but you you still got to do it military hazing exactly there's no room there's no room to go back to say hey sarge um i just couldn't do it you know right you can't do that you there's no room for room for error um, and then I got stationed back here in California at Vandenberg Air Force Base. Mm-hmm. And that's where um, I did a lot of aerial photography from helicopters. We used to take photos of Titan space launches and Minutemen, which, you know, they were MX and then they renamed them to Minutemen or Peacekeepers. Um, so all that stuff. So taking photos. And that was another example of there's no room for error in this stuff. So you're shooting film. Again, you're in a helicopter. You don't have a lot of time. You can't change the lens once they light the thing off, so you have to shoot it. They typically launch them at night, so you're essentially taking a photo of the surface of the sun at night from a moving vehicle <laughs> in the air, you know, <laughs> with no room for error. Uh-huh. And typically we shot slide film. Derek, you know what slide film is. It's very unforgiving, right? So, That's the definition of no room for error. No room for yeah. error, right? So, which was good back then because it's like, okay, you had to think about it. You had to sit down and think about, okay, this this is what the environment's going to be like that I'm going into. Mm-hmm. I need this lens. I need this body. Okay, now I have my kit set up. I need to duplicate it just in case this one fails. I'm shooting this speed film because the lighting's going to be this and all that stuff, you know. So it got me, it got me, and I, I still pull on that today because we have training wheels today in a lot of ways with digital because you can go out and shoot raw and you have all this kind of latitude. But back then, there was none of that. And in fact, the importance of that stuff, the, how critical it was, there's typically, um, there was a one UH-1 helicopter that would orbit the launch pad on one of these launches at about three miles out from the launch pad. So we're mm-hmm. three miles away from it, aiming at the launch pad to shoot this thing in the middle of the night. <laughs> one time they launched one, I think, this was a, I think this was a Titan actually, they lit one off and instead of going out over the Pacific, it started going in towards... Santa Maria. <laughs> so, oh my gosh. So they had to self destruct it. They had to, they had to uh-huh. blow it up, which then made this giant Roman candle of rocket fuel uh-huh. and rocket parts, all classified, fall on Vandenberg. Holy. So we had to land and spend the night taking pictures of everything. They were like charred jackrabbits trying to get away, you know, <laughs> doing all that stuff. But again, no, no room for error. We went from we're taking a picture of the surface of the sun to we're taking pictures of broken debris on the ground on the beach so fun stuff you ever shoot film anymore i have not i want to get back into it I've do been, you yeah i really do i really do because it to... sounds like obviously you have so much of your film world must help you now because yeah. you don't have to just put little band-aids on to right. pictures There's that weren't compromises, set up compromises right uh in pre-production mm-hmm. Derek, what about you film I have no desire to shoot film. No? <laughs> no? I did it. was scarred. I, 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 I did, slide film and then... I did it for, for so many... I came up through the newspaper business, so we, we spent a lot of time in the, in the dark room. And um, you do learn things. You do learn, like, you have to shoot better because it's really hard to print uh, a thin negative. Mm-hmm. And you go, okay, so I'm not going to underexpose. You know, you learn that, you know, early on, stuff like that. But uh, I... I was happy to have the film days. I enjoyed them, mm-hmm. and I was really glad to get away from them. And I, I could, I couldn't enjoy digital more. <laughs> You're yeah. not hearing the siren song of film. No. And it didn't, and it didn't like <laughs> you didn't have to warm up to it at all. You were like, I'm no. in. I'm in. Bring digital. I'm in. Because I think that's in many cases that's uh, you don't hear that all the time. Mm-hmm. I remember when yeah. I was when I was in college. It was you know the late '90s, and the digital photography certainly existed, but. I was still taking classes in a dark room. Mm-hmm. They weren't even offering digital photography. I don't, certainly not to entry level students like me. It's like you got to learn the real stuff before yeah. you're going to be able to cheat. Yeah. And you had I a think lot that's of an interesting professors analogy, yeah. who would yeah. they would give off that impression, yeah. and you could tell that they didn't necessarily like these fancy tools. Yeah, I don't know how. Yeah, that that is a, that cheating analogy is interesting. Cheating, that's yeah. kind of like yeah, saying you got to learn to ride. You got to learn how to control a horse and buggy. 
because it's cheating driving a car. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's right. just, it's well, it just, sounds silly now, yeah. but you know, yeah. there's always that point where the industry changes and people get scared. Yeah, right. Yeah, and that happens. In, I mean, that happened in the graphic design industry, right? Mm-hmm. Remember when the whole revolution came out and there people were suddenly they could use different fonts on the same page and all this crazy stuff and it, you know and people you know and people resisted it you know the 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 old school graphic designers that were still using you know the exacto knives and pasting everything up on the board and sure. all that were resistant to the max and all this stuff and then where are they now you know they sort of fade to black and these new guys are out here creating all these crazy multimedia things. So. Well, I think there's a misimpression that digital photography is somehow easier. Mm-hmm. Uh, average, right. average photography has always been easy since Kodak came out with the first camera. Average photography has always been relatively easy for its period in time. Uh, great photography has always been a challenge that you had to go to the next level. And just like now, if you want to point a digital camera at a subject and take the same shot that everyone else uh, can mindlessly take. Uh, yeah, it's easy, right? You can just upload it right to wherever and it's done. If you want to make a shot that's different than what everyone else would take, it's still hard. You know, it's still hard. So uh, I think I think that's a misnomer saying that digital is somehow cheating or something. It's, it's a whole different medium. And it's the thing about it uh, for me as a, as a photographer is that it's easier now for me to make real what's in my brain when I take the shot compared to before. And my biggest problem with darkroom work was that when I did nail it before, I had one copy of it, right. you know, one right. print. Right. Uh, whereas now when I do nail it, then now I have a, a piece of artwork or a photo that I can do all sorts of things with. And uh, I don't lose that work that I did before. So, I, you know, I, I love digital. And it's the convergence of so many things. Uh, social networking's, you know, into it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it brought in the whole world of uh, computers and all that stuff. And so, for me, it's a it's a very exciting place. And I have a lot of my uh, assistants and second shooters and stuff. They go, I'm, you know, I'm shooting film, you know, and they they do these little things. And um, it's great because I think it's it's really good training ground. And uh, it's a, it's a great medium for certain types of photography, film will never go away because there's a certain look that you can get with film that you can't get any other way. But uh, it's when people become extreme about it that, that makes me smile. And I'm only going to shoot film. Yeah, they weren't only in photography. Yeah. You know. It's also, I, I mean, I guess if you're, if you're a professional and you know where to go and where to get your gear, that's one thing. But it's not easy to just say, oh, I'm going to be a film photographer now. Right, right. I mean, it's hard. I, all the wolf cameras I can think of have <laughs> shut down that yeah. are within a mile of my house. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think the, the, whole, the whole film thing, I mean, there's a, a lot of people that, are, that haven't even embraced digital yet. So there's a whole crowd, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the resurgence that we're seeing is, you know, it's kind of like, a, you know, like the woodworkers, you know? Yeah, you can go buy a table from Ikea or whatever, but, you know, I want to I do it myself. I want right. to get that feel. I want to make the mistakes. I want to I limit myself with 36 exposures and no, I can't change the ISO later, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And see what I come up with, you know, so the restriction. Well, we've come to the part of the show where we get to talk about our subject's favorite photos. Mm-hmm. Uh, my subject, but your subjects. Mm-hmm. Um, Derek, did Leo and you go through yours? We did. Good. It was good. fun. I bet. And we'll critique you harshly. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, we won't. No, no. <laughs> Not with Derek here, too. So um, <laughs> let's, uh, Tony, Leo if you want to pull nice up to one, of, um, one of Frederick's favorite photos. Well, this is, I mean, you don't even, that's easy. Yeah. These yeah. are good. Yeah, those I mean, two, like, Tony, if you click on that one, it'll stop, it'll stop going to the next one so like these photos i put these in that gallery those two specifically because i was shooting their mom and uh-huh. and they were shy and they they didn't want to leave the set and so they were actually holding on to her leg down oh, they, it's not that they wanted to be photographed they just no. wanted to be near her. they wanted to be near her mom yeah. be near their mom so they were holding on to her leg when i was shooting their mom and i just started shooting them that's and cute. that's an example of Keep your eyes open when uh-huh. things are going. Because, you know, honestly, the photos of her didn't even make it to my portfolio. Right. You know, but the photos of the kids were priceless. And these are, like, blown up large and hanging in their house now. You yeah. Know? So that's, that's why these are in the gallery. And these are, these are my favorites because they just sort of, they, they reflect kind of the idea that 
that if you keep your eyes open, even when you're like shooting landscapes, you don't focus on, okay, I'm shooting El Capitan in Yosemite, you know, and I need to get that shot that everybody else is getting. But if you just sort of look around a little bit and you might get something completely different than you went there to well, get. Well, especially look behind you. Yeah. Yep. Especially look behind you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of times there's a fantastic shot there. Yeah. It's kind of a, a joke of the universe that a lot of times when you're really focused on something, the universe will present a great shot right behind you. <laughs> exactly. Just, you, just there a was a shot. You. Did you see this, this shot? I think it was, I forget where I saw it. I'm one of the social networks or something. There was this guy that was taking pictures of something mm -hmm. and a moose walked <laughs> right behind him. Right. Exactly. <laughs> you know? It's that kind of thing. Exactly. You know, just yeah. keep your eyes open when you're shooting yeah. and, and you never know what's going to happen. Which is something that, I mean, if you had sat down with their mother a couple days before, make sure she's not crazy. Okay, we're going to yeah. do this nice mm -hmm. photo shoot. You didn't know that you were going to be presented with this the situation right. so it, even as prepared as you were mm -hmm. you kind of also had to be flexible yeah you got to be flexible and skill comes into it too because so you have to not only do you have to be flexible but you have to be able to get the shot as yeah. well so it all comes together you know it's uh it's interesting that's why i love photography because it's like this mixture of serendipity with technology with art and psychology that all just sort of forms together then you you know you, hopefully if it all works you get good stuff well yeah because you look at the picture of the sisters and you're you there's like an emotional thing that happens mm -hmm. but yep. you provide a little bit more of the backstory but you a lot of that just comes through anyway yep yep all right do we have another one tony so if you pick one of those macro shots like this one was done wow. um a couple weeks ago at Derek story's workshop yeah. Um, he, he invited me down to attend his macro photography or close-up photography workshop. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is one of the images that I produced out of that. Now, this was, I put this in this gallery because I just want to talk about what I went through to get, <laughs> to get this shot. You know, a lot of people look at it as like, oh, Frederick was just meandering through a flower garden and saw this drop uh -huh. um, you know, and took a picture of it. Boom. No, this was, I had a, a, you know, full disclosure, I had a spray bottle there with uh -huh. water in it. Uh, this is a flower out of Derek's. I think this is out of your out of your little it was, it was nursery out thing. There. Yeah, it was out back. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so you know, wet it down, and once you wet something like this down, it's not like that water's going to hang out there. So this this photo is one of about a hundred that wow. <laughs> that actually that actually worked. And when you look at macro photography, it's generally like that. You know, which I learned at the mm -hmm. workshop. Mm -hmm. This generally, you see this perfectly posed bee on this flower and they're close up and you can see the the little segments of the eye and all that stuff that shot is probably one of several hundred shots that the photographer did because the other hundreds of shots were out of focus the bee was moving and the same here you know i couldn't get the the drop to be exactly where i wanted it mm -hmm. in fact this is not what i wanted the shot that i wanted was the drop separated from the petal and in midair you know that's what i was trying to get this yeah. is the best i could do <laughs> so. Yeah, the, the thing I like to say about macro photography is that everything becomes magnified, especially your mistakes. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> totally. So. Yeah, same here. So this is this shot I put in there. This is from that same flower, I think. But um, the lesson that I took away from this one is you don't have to show the entire piece of a subject in order for it to be really interesting. Like, we're looking at this flower in a way that a lot of people probably haven't looked at this flower yeah. before. I mean, we're looking at the, the pollen in there, we're looking at the petals, we're looking at the water formations and the spacing and the refractions of the water on the petal. Like, normally, you just this, this flower was literally about this big. Like, mm -hmm. like that big. It almost looks like a bowl of fruit or something. Yeah. You almost, what am I looking at? Yeah, and you, know, you look at these, like, uh, uh, macro photography is, like, becoming one of my new sort of passions, thanks, Derek. Because you, we were talking about during the workshop, there's this whole world of miniature that's around us even mm -hmm. in here i mean there's yeah. like all these little details yeah. that just look insane when you blow them up sure you know and then you don't have to go to you know far away places now this shot uh, there's a series that i did here that i i had in my head and i had to do it i couldn't leave the workshop without doing this one it was three flowers i just wanted to do a series of images there's this white one there was the the reddish one and then a, a photo of them together so Again, with that whole theme of beginning with the end in mind, yeah. I was shooting for a particular wall in my house. So I'm like, okay, I want to build a photo series for a wall in my house, mm -hmm. and I'm going to use Derek's workshop as an excuse to do it. And those flowers were actually next to each other, or did you? No, no, I posed those. Yeah, you did? I posed those. There's an interesting story behind how those, <laughs> those flowers got there. Derek, you was. <laughs> 
How did those flowers even make it? <laughs> These workshops sound kind of fun and zany. They are. They are they're a hoot. So originally he was going to shoot it on Saturday, and a lot of stuff happened, and he he didn't have a chance to do it. And so he had plucked the flowers. He, you know, he'd go, can I pluck? Because, you know, I had all the plants and everything. And he had plucked them. And he says, I want to shoot these two flowers. And, and one of the things he brought to the workshop was this concept of doing a project, which was fantastic. And people yeah. really got into it. So then we had the next day, and we had these two little flowers. And I saw them on the table, and they were looking all sad and wilty and everything. <laughs> <laughs> I go, those are Frederick's flowers. So I just put them in water, and they came back. And I just held them in water. And then the next day, uh, you know, he pulled them out. They were as good as gold and yeah. and he shot them the next day and they turned out great now those flowers that you're looking at they're only about that big yeah Wait, you know? they look huge yeah, yeah. no yeah. They're, they're like they're just the little tiny things. Yeah. yeah in fact when you look at them from a far away they're the petals on them look like petals but when you get close on them this is cool the the petals are actually tubes yeah that go in there and those are like one of those little details that you would never know Unless you were doing this kind of photography. You just don't see things like yeah. that with your eye. No, yeah. no, look at them. See, those are like, all the petals are tubes that go into the flower. So it was like, just those little things, that, that's one of the takeaways I get. Like, you mm. could just take a macro lens and maybe a spray bottle out to the park and do some really cool photography. Yeah. So, all right, uh, Derek, you... Um, that's a cactus, by the way. Posted a... Yeah. It is? That is a cactus. Oh, that's yeah, awesome. a cactus. That is a cactus. It's really cool. It's a little Thank barrel you. cactus that's about, you know, what, uh, three inches tall? Yeah, maybe. it's one of those little tiny baby yeah. ones. Yeah, yeah, it's just a baby barrel. So what, what is the cool new gear for macro photography? Oh, um, well, what I was shooting there was a 105 micro, I believe it was, uh, on Nikon D7000 body. Mm -hmm. um, as far as a cool new gear, you have to ask Derek. So I, was, <laughs> I was rogue. I was shooting with what I had. <laughs> Well, it, we were doing DIY as much as anything, right? Yeah. This is just fun. But the, the stuff that uh, I think you need is you need a good macro lens. So uh, the lens that Frederick talked about on the Nikon side is good. On the Canon side, we have the 100 F2.8 mm -hmm. IS, you know, mm -hmm. which is a beautiful lens. A couple extension tubes. But then, you know, we get into to doing things like a, like a focusing rail. That, that mm -hmm. really makes things easier. Mm -hmm. A ring flash is a lot of fun. And you don't have to buy... You know, the super expensive ring flash, you can buy something like a, an Orbis ring flash yeah. that's about $250. Or we even use a, a DIY ring flash that you get it as a flat package. It's all cardboard and stuff, and you build it yourself. And uh, it actually works really well, and that's yeah. like $35 so the whole kit, including the bracket. Oh, price is right. So there's a, but, you know, lighting is a big deal in this kind of photography. So... Uh, once you get your lens and your camera straightened out, you really need to think about how am I going to light this and, mm -hmm. and, and how am I going to control the lighting. And that, that's where it really starts getting exciting. Yeah, gear, gear aside mm -hmm. um, to have it set up uh, properly. Frederick, you mentioned the D7000. Mm -hmm. is, that your, is that your camera beloved? It, it never strays too far from me. <laughs> yeah. This is my D7000. I still love her dearly. Um, and, you know, I have, I'm a Nikon guy, right? So I have a, a Nikon D3, the older one, and a mm -hmm. Nikon D700. And honestly, since I've gotten this puppy, uh, they've been kind of hanging out lonely. Yeah. Um, for a couple of reasons. I like the size of this one. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's smaller, and it just, it seems less like a commitment of like, okay, you have a camera. You can have this in a bag, and you're not, yeah. you know, yeah, like you your, shoulders your shoulder don't hurt. It just doesn't look, it, it just... It just feels more compact. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's the video aspect of it because right. it shoots, you know, very high quality video. And I've been doing a lot more of that recently. So having all that in just this little package right here, it's like a, my content creation machine right there, you know, yeah. and I, I love it. Plus, it's got the, you know, the built in, uh, the, the, oh, we won't turn on now. But it's got the uh, a pop-up flash in here, which will act as a commander for the Nikon CLS system. So I can control a number of, thir of, of Nikon strobes directly from this camera. Oh, that's cool. And control their settings directly from here with no other additional hardware. It's like a stereo anything. receiver. Yeah, totally. That's exactly <laughs> what it is. Yeah. Well, that uh, allowed him to use a uh, do-it-yourself ring flash, too, because he didn't mm -hmm. have to have any wires or anything. The camera could just tell the flash to go off, even though it wasn't connected. Yep. Yeah. Yep. You mentioned that you like video. Now, mm -hmm. I find that the popular answer on this show is people say, oh, yeah, that video is fine. Great, 4K, but that's not what I do. Mm -hmm. I'm a still photographer. I don't get into that stuff. Mm -hmm. And, in fact, I've even heard it's a little gimmicky to put video in this beautiful camera that I'm using for photography yeah um i don't agree with that i don't subscribe to that school of thought i am not a videographer 
And mm -hmm. I, you know, because for one, in videography, of course, there's other people that, that in here all know, I mean, there's huge, gigantic file sizes. There's right. the time commitment of editing that video and understanding the language of editing. And then there's understanding the, the software. And then there's archiving. It goes on and on. It's a, it's a rabbit hole that I'm not willing to start going down yet. That said, um, where I do think it fits in is, like I was saying, I think we're all content creators, especially in this kind of world. Um, and though I'm not, I don't have any aspirations to create a short film yet, I do want to create short YouTube interview clips. And, sure. you know, maybe I'll do a little tutorial on how I did the macro, you know, that kind of stuff. That's more documentary, segmented documentary rather than storytelling. I think we need to, in, in order to do that, you got to have a tool like mm -hmm. this, you know, and you can't say, well, get that stuff out of my camera. It's here, you know, so why not use it? And that was one of the main reasons I got this particular camera is to do stuff like that. Because we have, I mean, the one-two punch of having this guy and a YouTube account means you can do some crazy stuff, sure. you know? So, you know, I'm happy with it. Like I said, you know, the people that say, you know, the poo-poo the video, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not going to, I'm a still photographer at the core, but um, I'm not, I'm not going to shy away from creating content that's motion, you know? Or audio, it's the same with audio. Derek, what do you think about the video versus still debate? Well, I think there's a place for it in, in what we're doing, and especially, I think he hit it on the head. If you're a content creator, if that's what you're doing for a living, there are just some situations that video do does very well, mm -hmm. and it's nice to have. I Most of my videos that I publish are not longer than two and a half minutes, and hopefully they're only a minute or so. Uh, that's the kind of stuff I do, but you can tell a lot of story in one minute or a minute and a half. Uh, and so if, if that's the best way to get the story across, then I'm all for it. Yeah. I guess yeah. especially if you're, if you're using a lot of social tools on a regular basis, we're just yeah. used to video, you know, yeah. tutorials, conversations, mm -hmm. sure. interviews, that sort of thing. And why have bad quality video when you don't have to, when it's built in to your rig. Right. Uh, iPhone 4 photography, I guess you don't shy away from that because one of your other favorite uh, peripherals, I guess, is, yes. it, is, it, is it gimbal? It's gimbal. I got to show you this. I show All everybody right. this thing and I'm going to show you guys. Okay, good. So I'm, I'm the kind of guy, I don't this like... Is, this, is, this is the kind of camera I have. This one, which is perfectly yeah. adequate, Take right? Take it everywhere with me. You always have it with you. This is an <laughs> iPhone 4S and this is a case that slips on there. It's one of those kinds that's in two pieces. Uh -huh. So it has the bottom and then, you know, you just clamp it on there. It's got a little hole for that. But the cool thing about this case is it comes with this piece okay which is really cool so it has this little slot on the side that goes in and now my camera has a magical little cool tripod Whoa. <laughs> on it that i can turn like that i can turn it like that i mean this thing allows you i mean it, like to geek out for a second on this so if you look at this tripod and derek you you can you guys can uh sit or uh relate to this the camera is directly over the yeah, nodal just, point mm -hmm. of the tripod. Mm -hmm. And that's the way they designed it so that you can, when you take photos, say you're doing a panorama, uh -huh. it spins around the center axis of the tripod so you get perfect panoramas wow. every single time. I use it like this when it's sitting on my desk. It's like that. So if someone calls me, I need to do a FaceTime call, I can answer it. That's it's, great. It's done. If I'm traveling, this sits on the nightstand. You know, I can pop it off and stick it in my pocket. It's just awesome. It's well, a great so it's tool. more precise than say something like a Gorilla Pod. Yeah. But also, it's a case. It is it's, a case. It's as a well. case and a tripod. Yep. So it's uh, and and a stand. And quite a stand. Frankly. And a stand. And they designed it to be a holder too. So if you're shooting video and that sort of thing, you could turn it like that, and now you have a. You can shoot video, you That's know, great. your little pans and, you know. That would that probably stuff. help me remember that I'm supposed to go. Horizontal? Yeah. Are you the person that shoots video? I, try, I mean, I don't know how many times I have to get it wrong before I remember just to turn the darn thing. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, no, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, I like it a lot. It's really cool. And one of the magical things I think about this device is they started, I'm a big fan of the whole Kickstarter project where they yeah you know people it's crowdsourced funding for mm -hmm. projects this is a product of that oh really yeah it was a kickstarter project that the guy needed to get funded and uh you know he asked the community people liked it and he put it out and now look at it there, was, it. there was some uh, article i read because kickstarter is just 
there are so many projects on Kickstarter now that are so cool that it's like everyone's paying attention. Yeah. And that the majority of the Kickstarter projects were all, you know, creative designs that, um, that, that just for whatever reason hadn't been thought of by larger companies that you would have expected to make something like mm-hmm. this before. Yeah. Yeah. For whatever reasons. Room I mean, for creativity. You know, amazing things happen when you take bureaucracy out of the mix. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I love, you, Cor- I love you, corporate America, but amazing <laughs> things happen when you take uh, meetings about having meetings out of the mix and you get down to the cool thing that, hey, I just want to make a tripod and I need X amount of dollars to do it. Mm-hmm. Can you help me? Right. And then this stuff happens. Yeah. So I think it's amazing. Well, we've come pretty much to the end of our hour. Um, I want to thank you both so much. Mm-hmm for uh, being so kind and giving us such good information and stories and war tales and, <laughs> you know, the whole thing. And I was talking yeah. about Silicon Valley just then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the war tales of Silicon Valley. But um, uh, Derek Story, who has been on a previous episode of Twit Photos, so certainly look mm-hmm. up um, look up that, uh, that episode as well uh, to hear a lot more about uh, Derek's uh, history and his conversation with Leo. And Frederick Van Johnson, thank you so much for being here. You're it was welcome. nice to meet you after all of this time. I know. It's a shame. It's it's a sin that we hadn't met before. Tell folks, uh, obviously, This Week in Photo, mm-hmm. you host this. We've talked about that quite a bit. But where else can people find you online? Where are you hanging out most these days? Um, I'm hanging out. I just relaunched my personal blog. So, okay. So um, they can get to me there. It's just, just frederickvan.com. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm very proud of it. It looks great. Thank you. I'm very happy about that. Um, and I had to get it done. I just published it this morning because I wanted it to be ready for the show. <laughs> so, um, so that's that's like my home on the internet now. Of course, This Week in Photo uh, dot com mm-hmm. is where the podcast is. You can find us in iTunes. Search for TWIP. And then Mediabytes with a Y dot mm-hmm. com is my consultancy. Wonderful. So you're busy. I'm a little busy. You're busy. Well, thank you for taking the time to come hang with us today. Uh, remember, uh, if you ever want to uh, give us a lot of feedback. We try to um, take all your questions and comments and incorporate them into our next episodes. Twitphoto at twit.tv is our email address. And a quick reminder that both Catherine Hall and Trey Ratcliffe are going to be at the Google Plus Photo Conference on May 22nd and 23rd. Mm-hmm. If you want more information about that, it's G plus PC. So the letter G, P L U S P C dot com. Next week's guest, Eddie Tapp. He's recognized as a top expert on digital photography and Photoshop and knows a thing or two about Adobe, like these guys. So you don't want to miss that. Uh, For now, I am Sarah Lane filling in for Leo Laporte and Catherine Hall on Twit Photo. We'll see you next week.